From Eyewitness News, this is Newsmakers. Welcome to Newsmakers. I'm Ted Nisi filling in this week for Tim White. Hard to believe, but the Massachusetts primary election is now barely two weeks away. Voters in the Bay State will go to the polls September 4th, the day after Labor Day. So you have to go straight from your barbecues or whatnot uh, to choose party nominees. So to get you up to speed, we have a great panel here today for a political roundtable to break down the key races and look ahead to the fall campaign. Joining me are old friend of the show, Lauren Dzinski, reporter for Politico Massachusetts. Mike Dean, he is a state House reporter for WGBH News out of Boston. Shannon Jenkins is political science professor at UMass Dartmouth. And Peter Ubertakio is dean of arts and sciences, the College of Arts and Sciences, I should say, at Stonehill College. Thank you, everyone, for being here. Thanks for having me. Uh, Thanks so for having us. we are going to break down the races, but I want to start with uh, a question I have for all of you, which, you know, and we have plenty of people watching in Rhode Island, too. Keep an eye on Massachusetts. All people in Massachusetts, in Rhode Island, know is that Charlie Baker is very popular. We hear that constantly. Charlie yeah. Baker, oh, he's so popular, the governor of Massachusetts. So the question I have for you is, can Charlie Baker be beaten? I'll start with you, Mike. Yes. A, a Republican can always be beaten in Massachusetts. Will he be beaten this time around? It seems unlikely. However, his challengers, Jay Gonzalez and Bob Massey, are running fairly good campaigns. There's not a ton of excitement to take down Baker at this point in time. Um, none of the you know, A-list Democrats like Amara Healy decided to run against Baker for re-election, to challenge his re-election. Uh, but this race is going to narrow after the primary. Uh, you know, Baker will be running more towards the center and these, the Democratic nominee will be firing away at certain issues, things like the MBTA, uh, you know, the state trooper scandal, things like that that we've been going on in, in Massachusetts. And it, the polls will come closer. Um, I think that a lot of people don't see them coming as close as they would need to to knock off a very popular company. Lauren, you talked to the campaigns. Are they How confident are they feeling in Baker world right now? Yeah, I mean, make no mistake, Charlie Baker understands that he is running for re-election, and he knows at the end of the day that he needs to beat Democrats in what is being acknowledged as a wave year for Democrats nationally. So that, in part, explains why Baker is raising so much money, is running ads already, um, and is really trying to distinguish himself as someone who has the benefit of four years of incumbency as as governor and as the most popular governor in the country. That's no mistake, but expect him to ride on that narrative through this election. Peter, you've watched a lot of races in Massachusetts. You uh, take the temperature of the electorate there. What do you think? Do you think Baker at this point, it's, it's too late for the Democrats? Do you think they could still somehow uh, knock him off? I think it's largely too late. And Massachusetts hasn't turned out an incumbent governor in a general election since 1974. <laughs> And you have, going into this general election, the most popular governor in the country. So you'd have to go from being the most popular governor in the country to someone who can barely squeak by. Having said that, it is a good year to be running as a Democrat in Massachusetts. The, the disadvantage for Democrats is Charlie Baker is a Charlie Baker Republican, not a Donald Trump Republican. And so they're going to they're gonna try to unload on him and tie him to the White House. I don't really think it's going to work. Shannon, your thoughts? Uh, I, I'm going to go with the yes, he's beatable side on this one. Um, his margin in the last election, I think people forget, was pretty slim. It was about 40,000 votes, which is not a lot. That was um, over more, uh, Martha Coakley, the former Attorney General. Correct, who ran a horrible campaign. I think everyone will acknowledge that. Um, and I think um, if you look look at sort of the Democratic organization on the ground, it's much stronger in Massachusetts than the Republican organization. Healy and Warren are already out door-to-door -door canvassing. Um, whoever wins the Democratic nomination is going to be able to latch on to that um, built organization. Um, Charlie Baker doesn't have the ground game. He's just got the airwaves and the money. Um, so it's not probable, but I think it's possible. Interesting. So let's uh, talk about those Democrats who are running. There is a Democratic primary for governor in Massachusetts. Can't say it's gotten necessarily a ton of attention uh, so far, but we have two candidates running, and that is Bob Massey and Jay Gonzalez. I'll ask you, Lauren, could you give us can you just a thumbnail sketch of these two candidates. Who are these two Democrats vying for the nomination? Yeah, so Jay Gonzalez is a kind of someone who has uh, been around state government in Massachusetts for a little while. He was a budget chief uh, for former Governor Deval Patrick, as well as someone who uh, headed up a health care company. I think it was Celticare uh, is what it was called, uh, before deciding to run for governor. And then you have Bob Massey, who is someone who has an incredibly long resume. He's someone who's really hard to kind of sum up in a quick phrase, but he is an environmental advocate. He's been a professor. He's written about a bunch of different things. He's traveled the world. Um, and he really talks a lot about the environment and things like that. So 
the best way to kind of look at these two candidates is that one is kind of this total outsider to the political process, uh, Bob Massey, whereas Jay Gonzalez is someone who kind of understands how Beacon Hill works because he has inhabited Beacon Hill before. Jay, you're up at the state house a lot. You know, uh, Jay, excuse me, Mike, you're up at the state house a lot. I'm going to ask you about Jay as well as Bob Massey and Gonzalez. Do you get a sense from, especially when it's a quieter primary, or is it hard to tell who's who's building up an advantage uh, when uh, for September 4th? Uh, if you look at a lot of the, the kind of roadmarks that we had so far. Gonzalez has a lot more money. Uh, he has the more typical insidery staff. Uh, Massey's staff has been some you know, people from outside and uh, not nearly as robust as Gonzalez has. Gonzalez did inherit a lot of that. Uh, Deval Patrick um, you know the, the, the base though of support and uh, you know employees for lack of a better <laughs> word that he had so Lauren is right that Gonzalez really is running the insider look but he I don't think he would ever admit that uh, <laughs> in a debate they I'm the insider candidate not a popular right. yeah, <laughs> because yeah, right. um, you know they're both running as Deval Patrick which mm. was an outsider challenging Beacon Hill challenging um, the Democrats in Beacon in um, Beacon Hill Massey is being far more aggressive against his own party, against the Democrats, who had not a very successful legislative session this year. Uh, Gonzalez is just targeting Baker, whereas Massey is, I would say, a f fairly more realistic look at the way state government is actually working right now. However, it is a political campaign, and your job is to beat Charlie Baker, so yeah. you can't fault Jay for that. Let me ask you, Shannon, uh, if you look at the two candidates, you know, we're talking about horse race stuff strategy there. Right. Do they have, have you noticed significant policy differences between them? One will give you a very different set of set of laws uh, signed? I, I think that's the real difficulty here for those of us who have been following it but even more so for people who haven't been following it there's really very little when you go into the voting booth you're gonna have very little information um, they're not particularly different I think Massey was trying to uh, paint himself as the more progressive candidate um, but in terms of that's what he's saying in terms of the actual differences I'm not sure there's a lot there um, and so it's gonna it's a really difficult race to sort of call in terms of who's ahead except for the money and the, the insider status I think gives Gonzalez a bit of an edge but given how low information it is for voters and how few differences there are between the candidates it's gonna be it's gonna be interesting to see where it goes I want to look at two at the Republican primary for governor which is getting even less attention if that's possible Charlie Baker as we said <laughs> very popular with the electorate statewide, but he does have a Republican primary challenger, uh, Scott Lively, very, very conservative uh, primary challenger, but who did get a, a, a significant slice of the vote at the state convention, I believe. Peter, uh, you know, you said before you think it's too late probably to beat Baker in the general, let alone I assume you also think it's probably too late to beat him in the primary. <laughs> It's well. It, it's far too late to beat him in the primary, and certainly someone like Scott Lively never really had a shot at beating Charlie Baker in the primary. What he does have an opportunity to do is to repeat what he did at the Republican convention and embarrass the governor uh, by demonstrating there is a fair amount of discontent within the Republican Party toward Charlie Baker, particularly among its very conservative and that small but very hardy band of social conservatives in Massachusetts. You know, Charlie Baker pulls better among Democrats than he does among Republicans. So. While he has oh, like a wait for him, there's a lot more of those in that's that's right. Right. See, Now, I don't think that actually hurts him. I mm. actually think that helps him to craft a message going into the fall election. He's going to lose a sizable number of Republicans. Um, it will be an embarrassment, mostly because he's going to have to share a ticket potentially with someone who's a on the uh, Senate nominee who's a pro Donald Trump mm. uh, Republican. Uh, Scott Lively will do a little bit of damage to the governor in the primary, but I don't think it harms him in the general election. Mm -hmm. And I think that's actually why you're seeing Baker essentially not acknowledge Scott Lively. If you're looking at Baker on the campaign trail, there is no recognition at all that he has a Republican challenger. And I think that's to partially protect himself from that embarrassment because I think so much of us kind of view Scott Lively's candidacy and how closely he is running to Trump a lot of the support that Scott Lively is getting is more of a protest vote mm. against Baker and against Baker's lack of support for Trump as opposed to straight up support for Scott Lively. And you, Mike, you covered the, the legislative session closely. I mean, you saw at the end there with the, the so-called grand bargain, mm. which was partly to head off some, some ballot questions uh, that uh, different interest groups didn't want. Uh, Charlie Baker signed some measures that that um, probably wouldn't get through oh, the course. Democratic legislature in Rhode Island, <laughs> yeah. where, I, where I'm spending yeah. most of my time. Tell us a little about how that happened. Yeah, well, basically, uh, there were um, ballot questions that were going to go forward on the minimum wage, paid family leave, and a kind of counter proposal to lower the sales tax back, back to 5%, um, because the retailers kind of had some some wants they wanted to get out of the legislature. Um, if, if that 
minimum wage was going to go up. So all three of these things kind of worked together. They ended up with what we call the grand bargain, which uh, raised the payroll tax to pay for that family leave program, uh, gave permission to raise the minimum wage to $15 an hour over the next few years, and uh, gave an annual holiday for, from the sales tax for the retailers. So everyone was fairly satisfied, but it's that payroll tax that mm. uh, Charlie Baker, who ran in 2014, saying he would not raise taxes or fees put his signature on it so you know this bargain could go through and avoid those ballot questions. A lot of conservatives see that as a breaking of that vow, a breaking of that promise. Uh, if you ask Baker, he says that it's uh, getting something new and that family leave is worth it, and it was really the only choice that he had in front of him. Um, but you know, if, if you are a no-tax Republican, you got to look at Charlie Baker's record here and, and think what was fair and what was reasonable. Do you think, Shannon, do you think, uh, are, were you surprised to see Baker sign something like that, or is it at some point he just, you know, he just can write off what Republicans might want? So I think I think Charlie Baker is in some ways a little bit between a rock and a hard place because the base is not really happy with him, his Republican uh, conservative base, because of these sorts of things. But if you don't sign the grand bargain, right, you have written the Democratic yep. nominees, uh, you know, campaign ads for them. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think one of the things that Baker is particularly concerned about and what he He's looking for is how, how do you mobilize the base um, and there's been a few bones I think he recently talked about yeah I'd like to see the death penalty come back for people um, who kill police officers that is that was a, a bone to the base right I mean because Nobody's going to say, oh, he wants a death penalty for people who kill police, right? No one's going to run against him on an ad. So he's trying to walk that walk where you don't alienate your base too much, but then you also appeal to those Democratic voters who you're very popular with and you, you need to keep on your side to win. One final thought on that before we, we go to the break, Peter. Um, you see Charlie Baker very popular as a Republican governing his moderate. You see uh, Governor Hogan in Maryland, a similar story. High sure. approval rating, Republican signing some things that are seen as more moderate. Do you think, is this a path forward neither it's so different from what we see coming out of the White House right now from Republicans well that's why I think the idea of the grand bargain I think only helps them it's just the phrase the grand <laughs> bargain <laughs> just, there, there's I, I see no downside here um, he upsets the small but hardy conservative part of the Republican Party pro-business Republicans uh, old-style conservative Republicans are with him on this grand bargain he, he works with Democrats, he, he's got the approval of independent voters. He, he can portray himself as everything you don't like in Washington, D.C. Everything you say you don't like about politics, we're avoiding here in Massachusetts. I work across, uh, I work across the aisle with Democrats, I work well with them. Democrats are going to endorse him for governor, like the mayor of Lawrence, Massachusetts, mm -hmm. who's going to be solidly behind him, and the, re the Democratic mayor of Boston is going to warmly embrace Charlie <laughs> Baker, I predict. So, you know, I think that, that uh, he, he represents the antithesis, but to your, to your point, um, it is not a path forward for national mm. party politics, mm -hmm. because the National Republican Party is firmly Donald Trump's party. Uh, Republicans like Larry Hogan or Charlie Baker, or others who work with Democrats who are, who are somewhat moderate, not always, but you know, viewed as moderate at least, there really isn't a future for them in the current National Republican Party. Interesting. All right. When we come back, we're going to turn to another big race, the U.S. Senate race, Democrat Elizabeth Warren, a national figure. But will she get a credible challenger? Stick with us on Newsmakers. Interesting. Newsmakers, I'm Ted Nisi. We are previewing the Massachusetts primary, which is coming up on September 4th, the day after Labor Day. We've got some key races we're looking at with a roundtable here. Lauren Dzenski is reporter for Political Massachusetts. Mike Dean is State House reporter for WGBH News. Peter Ubertaki is dean at Stonehill College, also a political science professor there before his promotion. I guess you're still also a professor, right? You're, I, you're I all am. things to all My, people. If faculty, faculty will still have me. Yeah, they, they'll, they'll <laughs> invite you in when yes. you're the one telling them we can't do this. That. And of course, Shannon Jackson. Jenkins, political science professor at UMass Dartmouth. I mentioned before the break, let's talk about the U.S. Senate. U.S. Senator Elizabeth Warren, Democrat to be Scott Brown in 2012. This is her first re-election race. She's a national figure. Uh, there's no doubt about that. But the, we now have three Republicans uh, looking to potentially uh, be the nominee to defeat Warren. That would be Beth Lindstrom, Jeff Deal, and John Kingston. Lauren, again, I'll ask you, give us a thumbnail sketch of these three and where things stand. Sure. So Jeff Deal, state rep, uh, he was very 
very closely tied to the Trump campaign in Massachusetts in 2016, is very much still tied to that wing of the party and is trying to run kind of within that lane. Uh, you have Beth Lindstrom, who uh, actually worked on, with Scott Brown, is kind of this uh, Massachusetts Republican insider among that like fairly small field of people because there's very few Republicans in Massachusetts. And then you also have John Kingston, who was someone who was a never Trumper in 2016, but has kind of shifted since then, has a lot of money that he has invested in his own race, um, has the largest campaign account in part because of that, um, is, and is running a lot of TV ads. So I'm sure you viewers are, are seeing ads from him at some point. So it's, it's interesting because they're all kind of occupying these three different lanes within this Republican primary field, but they all have to capture the vote of these Republican primary voters to then swing back to challenge Senator Warren. Mike, uh, same question. Uh, mm -hmm. As we talked about with Charlie Baker, I mean, in, it's a very good year for Democrats nationally. Elizabeth Warren is seen as a leader of the party. Uh, do, do any of these Republicans stand a chance? So much of this race has more to do with 2020 than it does 2018 at this point. I think a lot of that national money is going into Warren's kind of campaign coffers uh, because she is seen as a potential challenger to Donald Trump in two years. Uh, and the Republicans um, are not really making bones about the fact that they're trying to stop Elizabeth Warren from leading the resistance. Uh, those dynamics, those national dynamics are playing out in a way that is always kind of a part of a U.S. Senate race, but even more so when you have a, a, a very likely presidential candidate. And uh, even if she doesn't run for president, she's still the leader of the resistance. She's still uh, an extremely prominent critic. If you're a Jeff Deal, uh, who, as, as Warren said, is the uh, you know most Trumpy uh, of the, the candidates running against her, then that is another fundraising base. Then you are the Trump guy that is probably the least likely to win, mm. but the most likely to do damage or to, to hit her or get the money to, to hit her going forward. Do you think, Shannon, uh, we saw Elizabeth Warren take some criticism from police chiefs for her remarks, recent remarks about the criminal justice system, which you know often senators uh, can float above things and you don't see that as frequently. Do you think, is there going to be any tension between her national role and her you know, role as a Massachusetts senator? I don't think so. I mean, I don't. I, for most of the Democrats, right, they're they're solidly in Warren's camp. I think uh, for most independents, it does it does matter who gets uh, nominated um, in the in the Republican primary. But I think most independent voters are are probably going to lean towards Warren as well. Um, and so I think. She, She's definitely, you know, got her eye on this election, but certainly her positions are, to Mike's point, with an eye to 2020. And so that statement was really more about 2020 than 2018. Um, and so I don't think that's going to have much an effect on her 2018 race. And it's all about, you know, just sort of making it through to, to set yourself up for, Peter, for where you're going to be. do you be. think, do um, voters in Massachusetts mind when their politicians are eyeing a presidential race since the, half of them always seem to be? Uh, you know, or do you think, <laughs> it, does it help them even, like, oh, Oh, our senator might run for president. I, I think we, we mind if they don't. I mean, we rather <laughs> expect that if you are a Massachusetts political figure, uh, that you ha that you're thinking about uh, national office, it it really doesn't hurt, uh, and and it's so common. As I say, it's it's part of the landscape here that statewide figures in in Massachusetts are going to be thinking about running for president. Um, the national uh, uh, media looks to our, our political leaders for, for that. So I think it's, a, for, for many voters, a point of pride. It's become a talking point in the Jeff Deal campaign that you know he's, he's trying to ding her for not committing to serving out mm. uh, her term, even though he didn't commit to serving out his term when he ran for state <laughs> senate. Uh, so but it's probably it, not going to be. It may help in the primary, but it's probably not going to. Kingston just put out an ad, I think, uh, just recently, the same thing, showing her yeah. eating an Iowa corn dog. Right. <laughs> while he was eating a Fenway Frank. So, <laughs> so, um, yeah. so they're all making hay. Of Maybe it, in yeah. his luxury box. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And right. I suppose you see that at all levels. <laughs> right. I mean, you see a mayor who might run for governor. They're saying, well, you, you want to run for re-election as mayor, you won't. Will you stay the mayor, so I suppose it's just on a higher plane. Right. Um, I want to ask about, this is a race, it's a little insidery, but I find it fascinating. The race for Secretary of State, the mm. Democratic primary. Uh, William Galvin, Bill Galvin, as a, someone who grew up in Massachusetts, I didn't realize there had been other Secretaries of State. He's been <laughs> in the office for such a long time. But he has a young challenger from the left, Josh Zakem. Most important question to answer first, Lauren, is Josh Zakem related to the bridge? He is. He is the son <laughs> of the bridge. The, the man who the bridge is named after, that, that is Josh Zakem's father. And Josh Zakem is currently 
currently a Boston City Councilor. Bill Gavin, as I said, very long time figure, but it seems like Mikey has a real race. He does. Zakem uh, has a base within the Boston City Council, which the council doesn't do too much, as Galvin will tell you. <laughs> but it is a prominent role. Um, you know, like Lauren said, he's the son of Lenny Zakem, who was a very prominent activist uh, in Boston. A lot of people know his name and still deeply respect him for that. Um, Zakem has done work on the council over the years. And what we're seeing now is uh, almost a surprise challenge to, to Galvin. I think that Zakem wasn't necessarily uh, looking to challenge that particular office and then decided to and has come at him hard. It's taken Galvin a little while to staff up, get his campaign running, but he is a, uh, a veteran of the highest order and he is going to uh, hit back hard. And we're seeing that now in some negative ads <laughs> that are coming up over the last couple days. Yeah, Lauren. there's literally uh, attack ads that are being run against Josh Zakem from Bill Galvin, which for a constitutional office <laughs> like Secretary of State that is incredibly insider and fairly wonky, it is fascinating to basically acknowledge that this is the most contentious primary race in this cycle for it, us. It fits that profile of yeah. a, a younger, I mean, Josh is about 34 years old, um, challenging the, the veteran incumbent. We're seeing this a lot throughout the party and the Dem Democratic Party not really wanting to wait their turn anymore. And older Democrats not retiring either. Yeah, that's, <laughs> it's mm -hmm. the same And thing, I can yeah. see this going either. I mean, you see it can be so hard to get right. attention in a right. down ballot race, but also sometimes people just say, you've been in long enough. Right, I also think the important thing here too is that there's, there's real sort of, I think, substantive differences between the candidates, right? A lot of the younger, um, candidates want to paint that optic of being the outsider and being more progressive, but I think Josh really is. Um, Galvin has been foot dragging on a lot of what political scientists would say are important um, electoral reforms to expand access to the ballot. We're, we're, we're a pretty liberal state in Massachusetts, um, and we really are not anywhere near the front in terms of expanding access to the ballot. Um, and, and Josh Takem has really been out front about talking about the sorts of reforms that now all of a sudden Bill Galvin's like, oh wait, well, I support that too, right? You know, now all of a sudden, you know, the the 11th hour of the 11th day, he's finally on board and, and we get automatic voter registration finally. Um, so even if I think Zagum doesn't win, I think it does push the argument in Massachusetts about what does expanded access to the ballot look like. Mm -hmm. And so I think um, ultimately, this is not neither necessarily an endorsement of either candidate, but I do think expanded access to the ballot is good. And so pushing that conversation, uh, Josh Jacob, even if he doesn't win, will have a real impact on Massachusetts politics. I want to go to your home base, Cape Cod, uh, where you're from, uh, Peter, to talk a little about. There is a race out there. Congressman Bill Keating, the Democrat, is uh, has another person with a known last name, Peter Tedeschi, the That's Republican right. running down there. Again, Tedeschi, related to the Tedeschi family that we all know from the stores. He is indeed, uh, which gives him instant name recognition for everyone who has grown up in Massachusetts, uh, you know, Bill Keating in that in that congressional district will always have a Republican opponent because it is the I, I think one of the top two uh, districts in the state in terms of Republican vote. So he's always going to face a challenger every two years. He fa or every four years rather, he faces a kind of aggressive mm -hmm. challenger, and this is one of those years. Peter Tedeschi has high name recognition. Uh, he's going to have access to uh, significant funds, so he's giving uh, Bill Keating a real challenge. And that district runs from the South Shore. Uh, suburbs of Boston through Fall River and down in the Cape and Islands. And uh, Tedeschi, uh, by virtue of his last name, is going to be pretty well known. And so that is going to be a really interesting uh, general election because Keating has to face an opponent who's going to have instant name recognition on the ballot. You're down there as well, Shannon. Do you, I mean, it, it's a real challenge, do you think, for Bill Keating this year? Yeah, sure. I mean, there's certainly definitely conservative parts of the Cape and on into the South Shore and, uh, you know, New Bedford, Dartmouth, Fall River, that whole area down there is, is really one of the few, I would say, swing regions in the state. Um, it's not, you know, you look at Cambridge or up near Boston, it's always blue. Um, sometimes we're red, sometimes we're blue. And so that's, um, that. if you can swing that area along with those other parts of the Cape, um, you're 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 definitely gonna be able to mount a pretty effective challenge. You go further out to rent them anywhere. Barney Frank used to call it Utah. Yeah, right, Barney. Right. <laughs> One of the other interesting things about Peter Tedeschi, and I think kind of adds to the understanding around him, is that the district is conservative, but Peter Tedeschi, because he doesn't have a Republican primary challenger, he doesn't have the burden of winning the Republican primary. So he, you're not seeing him swing to the right in a way that you're seeing all of these other Republicans in these primaries be forced to do. And so he gets to occupy this lane, Peter Tedeschi, of this 
Charlie Baker Republican in a way that you really can't see any other candidates in other parts of the state. So after September 4th, in terms of races to watch, this is definitely one that's going to heat up. Uh, Lauren, I'm going to stick with you because we only have about a minute left. I want you to quickly recap a race outside of our viewing area, but the Mike Capuano, Ayanna Presley, uh, Democratic primary for Congress up, I think, outside of Boston, in Boston. In Boston. In Boston. 70% of Boston. Um, getting huge amount of national attention. Quickly tell our viewers why and what to watch. Yeah, it's captivating the interest of uh, the national media. Essentially, it's long-term incumbent Michael Capuano, who served roughly 10 terms, uh, is being challenged by another Boston City Councilor, Ayanna Presley. She is a black woman. He is a white man. Uh, it's essentially a, a primary battle that is questioning the face of the future of the Democratic Party. Uh, there's not a lot of policy differences between the two candidates. It's more about parity and representation. So it's definitely, uh, it's getting heated and it's definitely one that is uh, drawing a lot of national eyes. Mike D, in 10 seconds, where do you see that race going? I think that it's very difficult to defeat an incumbent congressman um, and especially given the base and the uh, just entrenched nature of Capuano's supporters. Um, he has had more than enough time to activate that base and mm -hmm. the, those voters there. And uh, He's it, not being caught sleeping this year, yeah. Precisely. Yeah. All right, Mike D and Lauren Dzinski, Peter Obertakio, Shannon Jenkins, thank you all for joining me. The Massachusetts primary is September 4th, so don't sleep too late on Labor, the day after Labor Day because you'll miss your chance to go to the polls. We'll keep covering it and we'll have another round table coming up getting closer to the general election for all of you in Massachusetts. Meanwhile, Tim White will be back next week. We'll see you then on Newsmakers.